views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to Bronx Talk. I checked our records and tonight's guest hasn't been with us in way too long, so we will fix that tonight. We've got a lot to talk about with the assemblymen from the 82nd Assembly District, which includes the Bronx neighborhoods of Carp City, Throgs Neck, Westchester Square, City Island, Country Club, and the Pelham Bay sections of the East Bronx. Please join me in welcoming Assemblyman Michael Benedetto back to Bronx Talk. It has been too long. It's nice to have you with us. It has been too long, Gary, and it's great to be here now. Um, and and let's, let's face it, it's probably my fault because when we invite him, he comes, and that's why he's here uh, tonight. Anyway, let's get started. You are the chair of the Education Committee. I am. In um, uh, the New York State Assembly. Um, let's get an overview. How, we, how are schools doing? What are the, the good, the bad, the ugly? Where, <laughs> where, where, where are we at? Well, it depends upon who you talk to. Well, I'm talking uh, to you. Well, so I know, I know. Good. I think on the whole, the schools in the state of New York are doing terrific. They really, really are. You know, I, I, I'd like to talk to about um, the experience I had with my, with my niece, who was a student in the, uh, um, the grammar schools here in, in the Bronx. Uh, unfortunately, my sister passed away some 30 years ago. And, and uh, my brother-in-law and daughter, uh, niece eventually moved to New Jersey. Okay. okay. And in New Jersey, she went to school. She was bored for the first year because the teaching in the, in, in the Bronx, in our neighborhood public school, was so far ahead of those New Jersey schools wow. that she was sitting there doing nothing. We quite often give a bad rap to our teachers, but they are the best in the world. Uh, what, what are issues that, I mean, I have a couple of things that I could pull up, but what, what are issues that you look at and say, well, when we get together through this next session that you've just begun in Albany, what are you going to put on the table? What do you want to move forward with? Number one, we need more money for education, okay? The governor has given us, a, you know, a raise in the, the money that he is allocating to special education, uh, to education in general. It's just not enough. We probably need, at the very least, the least, another billion and a half dollars put to education, okay? Um, and that's what we're going to be fighting for, first and foremost. Uh, let, you, you mentioned the special education numbers came out, and they were striking about uh, youngsters who deserve to be uh, earmarked for a special ed, but somehow they get lost in the system, and that could be one of the places where we really need to to put more money. Let's, it is. Let's, yeah. let's talk about that. And is it only money? Uh, are there systems or other things that can really work with uh, special ed kids to improve um, situations for them? There's so much money that's needed in special education, so on different levels. So, for instance, you have the problem of um, children who ha are dyslexic, okay? They have difficulty mm -hmm. reading, okay? It's a major problem. It's estimated that 40 percent, excuse me, 20 percent of the school children are dyslexic in some way. Well, what we're trying to do in the state assembly, at least, and hopefully the, the Senate will spot, uh, follow, is to have early testing. Uh, we believe there are measurements out there that can early on, I'm talking kindergarten, first grade students, that can be tested mm -hmm. quickly and cheaply, that we have all students in our system tested to see if they're dyslexic. So at an early age, they can begin remediation. And then on those remediation efforts, um, 
um, um, used standardized, well-known practices to move those children ahead. Money is everything, though. We got to get the appropriate. I, I was going to say, you know, you can test them and you can identify them, but if you don't have a place to put them or you don't have resources for them, that's that's going to be. An and issue. it involves teacher training to make sure now we have identified these uh, um, um, dyslexic. St students they need special training and special teaching methods so let's teach the teachers how to address that it always boils down to money uh, charter schools have um, you know many parents will say wait a minute this has saved my child's education yeah. it's been the greatest thing that's happened others say well you know what the charter schools are quote unquote invading our buildings they're taking our space they're robbing resources from uh, the the, the traditional public schools. Um, where do you stand on capping charter schools? Do we need more of them? Is the cap that we have sufficient? Would you expand it? Just give me your point of view. Well, there is a cap on charter schools, a, a ch cap in the city and upstate. The upstate cap um, um, has not been even near to being filled up. Okay, the cap. That's in interesting. I'm yes. I mean, I'm, of course, we're we're totally centered here in the city, and so I, I wasn't aware of that upstate. Yes. There, there, there is plenty of cap room upstate. In the city, not so. And people and the governor are pushing for um, what they call zombie charters to be um, their licenses uh, um, renewed. Um, the zombie charters are, I believe, 19 charter schools who have gone under. Let's that might not be the best phrase, but that's what's happened. It's reality. And so those charter schools didn't succeed. There are 19 of these schools. The governor would say, okay, there were 19 of them that didn't fail. Let's try somebody else in those positions. Mm. We in the assembly are resisting it right now. Um, we don't necessarily believe all the hype on all the charters. We would love to see charters to be open, um, to find out uh, what children they have have on, what suspension um, 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 disciplines they have in their schools. Mm -hmm. The problem is, are the charter schools getting rid of kids that don't fit? Yeah, and they're being selected. And artificially boosting up their scores. So um, the, the bottom line, the summary of that is that the assembly is still cautious about Very raising cautious. the cap. Very cautious. Yes. Uh, specifically because of what I identified that uh, may be taking resources from traditional public schools. And that's one of the reasons, too. They, to be honest, it's a reality. Charter schools are there. Charter schools have been allowed to come into the city and the state of New York. Okay. And they have been effect effective in, in Depending many Depending upon who you talk to, and, and, and if, uh, in some cases they have been, and they... I applaud them because right. children come first. But we also want them to be open and honest about how they, uh, what, how they deal with their children that they have in their schools. There has been a fight, and I don't know if you want to comment on it, over pay parity for early childhood education uh, Oh, teachers, I'll talk about that. <laughs> and also pay parity for teachers who work with autistic children. Now let's talk a little bit about that. Um, I, it seems to me the large issues have been resolved and there is pay parity between the independent schools and what uh, uh, teachers at the public uh, early childhood schools are getting. Uh, what do you think? Where well, are we at? It, when it comes to special ed kids and the special needs schools, these are schools uh, that are called um, 4201 schools, 4410 schools. They deal with deaf children, they deal with autistic children, um, preschool children. There is not pay parity there, too, and it's a major problem. I liken the idea to myself. I began teaching in the Catholic school system for my first five years or so. And um, immediately when I left the Catholic schools and went into the public schools, I jumped up maybe a 20% raise in salary. Uh -huh. When you have that type of a differential, how do you keep teachers in your school? This is what's happening to those schools. They, the some, independent, uh, I'm talking about independent uh, early childhood education. Early programs. childhood special education right. teachers, the 40, uh, 410 schools. Um, um, they are making, let's say, $40,000 a year. They can go to the public schools and they'll make $60,000 a year. For doing the exact same work. Exact same work and they'll only work 10 months a year instead of a 12-month year. Mm -hmm. How do you keep the teachers? And so these schools are hemorrhaging 
teachers right now, and, and they, it's difficult for them to even keep open. Uh, it's, it's one of the things that I am focusing on in, in, in this um, budget period. We've mm -hmm. got to do right by those dedicated teachers. Uh, just before the program, we were talking about uh, transportation and the importance of um, the transportation issues uh, in the borough of the Bronx. Um, let's start here. Um, the uh, Metro North stations that are coming, is specifically, he smiled as soon as I said that. Um, the Metro North stations, I guess, Cobb City, Morris Park, yeah. getting them, Hunts Point, and yeah. Parkchester are the four that we're getting in the Bronx. Um, what is your real expectation of the impact those can have and maybe will have in the borough of the Bronx. I'm going to use the word "will." It, 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 they are, All they right. are, it, they are going to come. It'll I be. I was hedging. I'm sorry. <laughs> and well, you should hedge because ever since I've been elected, which has been about 16 years, they were talking about. Uh, um, 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 the East Side Access Program being completed, and we finally getting Metro North stations. I'm very proud to have kind of led the Bronx. Um, effort to get the governor to agree to move on these, and he has. And uh, plans are being ma made to build the stations so that in the next year and a half or so, when the east side access is finished, we'll be able to move very quickly on these stations. These stations are coming. The people in the Bronx will now, and the people in those near those stations will finally, east Bronx. yes, in the East Bronx will finally have access um, by Metro North to Manhattan. And, by the way, going in the opposite direction, too, up north. To go upstate. Yeah. Um, and, and I realize certainly the transportation for those people will be improved. They can get to Manhattan easier. We, we, we get all that. What, what do you think the impact on the communities will be? I know I've talked to um, uh, people who are working, let's say, at the Hutch Metro Center, mm -hmm. and they're like, oh, my goodness, this is going to be a boon. Talk to me about, um, you know, what it might do for communities Economic development and other kinds of things. Well, it, there are so Park many City, different, of course, do, so many different levels you can speak to on on this. And yes, one of the stations will be in Morris Park and will be right near the Hutch Metro State uh, um, Station. Well, it, it it means an awful lot for people it, at the Hutch Metro. Um, Center, yeah. Yeah, to, to, to have people coming to get their medical services that they have there. And from all over making it easy. There is also another plan that I'm trying to raise consciousness in. Uh, in. Well, here you go. You got the forum. We got the platform right here. It's called the Triboro Plan, okay? Um, once these stations come in, there is a way to employ other railroad tracks in the city to have people coming from, let's say, Co-op City in my district, using the Metro North, which brings you on its way to Manhattan into Queens, be able to use tracks there in Queens mm -hmm. to shuttle to other tracks in Queens to bring you through Queens into Brooklyn and all the way out so to the end of Brooklyn. We're talking not necessarily only going into Manhattan, there but you actually go. binding. Um, what, what's involved in that? Is that an infrastructure project, it or is will it really be. just a connectivity kind it, of project? It, 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 the tracks are there. Um, there will be some um, uh, um, um, infrastructure that will have to be done. But since the tracks are there already, it's estimated that this can be brought to um, completion with about a billion and a half dollars. And when it comes to projects like this, that's a relatively cheap amount. And for the first time, people in the Bronx would be able to go to, to Queens or to Brooklyn and even Staten Island directly keeping away from Manhattan. It will save people time and money. It's a great idea. Just thinking out loud, does that include LaGuardia and uh, JFK? And that would, yes. One would think if you're going to do that, you'd, you'd want to do that. It would not thing. necessarily um, get to JFK that way, but at least it can bring you to, to a very close shuttle to get to it. JFK. You know, before we leave the idea of uh, traffic, I want to talk about... Um, uh, the Hutch Metro Center because it was built and it's been, I think, a highly successful development in the Bronx for business and for health care and for BronxNet has a, a station there, you know, we, all those kinds of things. But getting in and out, if you were to try to get out 
of the Hutch Metro Center beginning at 4 o'clock in the afternoon before you even get to the end of Waters Place. you got about a 20-minute I wait. made sure I'm not there at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> well, That's my solution to my us, problem. Those yeah. of us who tape TV shows at 4 o'clock don't have that luxury. This is something we've, we've been working on for several years now. Yes. The, uh, the uh, Department of Transportation has come up with a, what I think, an out-of-the-box type of a plan to create new entrances and exits going into the Hutch Metro Center. We've been trying to get the governor to come on out and formally support it and to put the money to begin the construction that will be needed and the and the, all the infrastructure problems. There, that, that's an infrastructure project. Oh, it is. You've got to do something with the roads. Oh, it is, but it might not be as difficult with the roads itself as for underneath the roads and all the wiring uh, uh, for the utilities that's that might be there that might have to be moved. But it's a major project, but it's a much necessary project. It is an economic hub for the Bronx, and we should do this. Mm -hmm. uh, one last thing on transportation. The Bronx bus redesigned, and I'm <laughs> only laughing because it was going to happen, and it was completed, and now it's being redone, and now they're looking at it, and every neighborhood's got an issue with this line, that line. Where, where are we at with the Bronx bus redesign? Well, and yeah. Uh, will there be a final plan? And, and I, I'm going to give you one, uh, somebody who uh, uh, commutes every, every day to, to and from work that I know very well, uh, gets uh, at the end of her train line at 6 o'clock, waited maybe a half hour for mm. a bus just to get home at the end of a work day. you got to have sympathy for Bronx working people. Absolutely, and certainly this has had been uh, a major focus of my efforts for the whole first half of the year. Um, not a day or week went by where there wasn't something uh, about uh, the Bronx redesign. By the way, uh, they're having their final this borough-wide meeting on this for people to throw last-minute comments I've got, I've got to put the final in quotation yeah. marks. I'm sorry. Like, like this. That's the final. It's the fi final public meeting for people who want to give more comments. But we have gone a l come a long way on this design with the MTA. And we were talking about this before. The relationships you build up over years being in elective office that I had. Um, um, opened a lot of doors for, for me with the MTA to um, talk about the plan. So talk if you about, had an issue or with your community, you had somebody you could talk hello. directly to. And in this particular case, I was dealing directly with Andy Bifit on so many different occasions about the proposals they did for Co-op City and for Throg's Neck and telling him... Uh, and he didn't believe me when I told him they're not going to like this. This is not going to take, take care of their needs. And he listened. And he listened, and and eventually they re, they reorganized well, their plans. I mean, that, and that, we that, won. That's the good news and bad news, of course. He's not there anymore. You'll have to start from scratch. That's yeah, well, issue. let's hope they don't have to start from scratch now. i, I got to bring this up, and it okay. just sounds it's so crazy to me, this whole thing with this wind turbine in Cobb City. Oh, my. And, I, they put it up, nobody liked it, nobody knows what it was really for. I mean, you know, it, it just went on and on. And then just, the, it was like right out of Shakespeare. The, yeah. the thing got, the, the wind turbine got blown over. How ironic is that? Uh, so why don't, why don't we talk about how it got there? Is there a, a, a kind of a political infrastructure issue there that put something in there that nobody wanted? And this was on the heels of this billboard that nobody wanted. Just let's go through some of that and what your perspective is. Well, of is. course, it, it, it started with the construction of the billboard that, that you know, was right. put up, and we were just so distressed about that. And at that time, there was another pole going up, a monopole <laughs> that looks so huge. I, I'm so sorry for laughing, but you know, from no. the outside, it just, it just didn't make any sense. No, it didn't. As a matter of fact, at the budget hearings we had that year, I was chairman of the city committee, and I was the first person to question the mayor. And I said, about this monopole, and he didn't even know what a monopole was, yeah, which well, is understandable. Well, it fell about. on some guy's car. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, fortunately, we were able to stop the construction of one that is now there, 240 feet. But all of a sudden, back in early December, in the middle of the night, 
they construct the rest of that monopole. The middle of the night. It was in the middle of the Literally, night that, that wow. was being done. And um, w the next day, we, we, we were on the phone immediately trying to find out what was going on because we thought the man, the, the developer, was going to put up another bigger billboard. And we were distressed, only to find out a couple hours later it wasn't a billboard. It was the wind turbine. And, and was the wind turbine going to uh, replace, uh, you know, other uh, forms of energy that were being provided? I could only guess on that, oh, that he was going to supply energy to the storefronts down uh, below. There were car charges that were being put in. And then two weeks later, the wind turbine I, blows down. I guess the bottom line is... Who controls that land? Who controls that property? Who is there some oversight? Can somebody say, you know what, this isn't such a good idea? Well, we or were, is it is it really still a problem? We were trying to get those answers. Oh. The, it seems that now the problem won't be anymore. They are rezoning that piece of property um, through the good offices and the and direction of my local councilman in in, in, in Co-op City, Andy King. Um, um, the owner of the property has come to an agreement um, not to put up the uh, billboards anymore, um, that he will never do a wind turbine again, <laughs> and in the future won't do anything with that property without first getting community consent. So there were major concessions made by the guy. Hopefully that's a, um, uh, an issue that's behind us, and with the rezoning, hopefully that will solve all future problems. Uh, let's uh, move uh, to one one of our, both of our favorite places in the borough of the Bronx and really anywhere in that city island. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've seen reports like this. Somebody says vacancies are down and we're doing mm -hmm. well. Somebody says, you know what, this storefront is gone. We lost this restaurant. Talk to me about the health of City Island Avenue and uh, kind of the small business infrastructure there. Well, I, I, I would be lying if I would say that uh, it is, the health is r robust. Um, I think it's still good. I still think it's a great, viable community. Um, but unfortunately, like many other business districts throughout the city, you have um, store vacancies that are there, and they must be filled. And we've got to come up with some encouragement to the uh, um, landlord community um, to fill those um, storefronts in do, some do way. Do we uh, substitute encouragement for tax incentives, or are there other ways of looking at that? You know, as a teacher, uh, <laughs> um, I, when you're trying to deal with kids who might be giving you problems, you try to do the best practices have shown. You, you use um, encouragement, you know, with the children, positive reinforcements rather than negative. So instead of yelling at a kid, you give him um, something to work for. In the same way, if you give tax incentives, I think, um, would be very good if they do and fill these on a quickly basis. I, 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 uh, I, I just I don't want to spend a lot of time in this because it's an idea that I've had for yeah. a long time. Why not have a trolley that brings people Friday and Saturday nights, uh, uh, you know, during the summer? People could park their cars at uh, Orchard Beach. There's plenty of parking there. And then shuttle them up back and forth to City Island. You could, you could use the trolley as an economic engine, as a promotional engine. Crazy idea? Not Just at all. Some, I, a wild idea that Gary has? I don't know. Good friend, I love the idea. A good friend of mine, um, um, Skip, uh, who was the, uh, you know Skip. Uh, of course, Skip. Uh, um, Skip is, or was, the um, head of the Chamber of Commerce Correct. on City Island. He was trying to refurbish a bus to do exactly that. I think it, I think it makes and sense. And it does make sense. Bring people out on the island and bring them on a bus so they can park elsewhere and be brought in without the lines of traffic clogging yeah, up the roadways. And, and there are people who would say, you know, I'd love to go to City Island tonight on a summer night, but I'm not going out there because I'm not going to be able to get on it. A uh, City Island tour, um, when you get on the bus that might stop off at the Bartopel Mansion to have uh, something going on there, followed by dinner on City Island and a leisurely all right, flow. Um, uh, let's go. It's we great. have a date, you and me, we'll go. There we go. <laughs> we'll be the first um, ones I, I to do show. want to talk about the, this oyster shell project, which oh, I'm, I'm my, very yes. much in favor of. You came up with this idea of a tax credit for the oyster. Talk about uh, what it is and, and why you think that's a good idea. Well, 
to be absolutely honest, I didn't necessarily come up with it. There was a citywide effort with many of the restaurants in Manhattan to do exactly the same same thing and throw those um, oyster shells in the, in the Hudson River, East River, and so on to help purify the water there. I've adapted it to our local, uh, you know, area. Um, because the people on City Island, on their own, um, started their own million-dollar oyster project. And I encouraged it um, uh, by giving a little contribution to them and putting a bill in to address a tax credit for those restaurants, for the restaurants who do participate. Who donate. Now, it, does that go. exist, or it's still on the floor? To That's still on the floor. The last thing I want to talk about, and we could do a whole show about it, of course, we left it for the end, but um, it's in the newspapers um, right now, and that is the notion of bail reform yeah. and whether or not it's time to take a look at uh, the, the right now as a controversial uh, bail reform uh, situation. As I understand the latest, is the Assembly is saying, you know what, let's give it more time. I saw many of your colleagues in the Assembly quoted in the newspapers. Um, is it time to relook at this uh, bail reform? Uh, there have been some high-profile um, pushback about it. Uh, what do you think? There's been an awful lot of pushback on it. Um, today's date is February 14th, Valentine's Day. That's the date Day. we're uh, taping it. Taping this yeah. right now. Six weeks. Now, I contend, is six weeks enough to evaluate a bill? Or if we do something, would it be considered a knee-jerk reaction um, to it? So you, your uh, idea now, because we're running out of time, your idea is to let, let's step back and watch for a little bit? Absolutely. I, you know, we don't want a knee-jerk change a, 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 a bill that is long time coming, long time perpetrated, and injustice on thousands of young men mm -hmm. who are incarcerated and not even convicted not even yet. Convicted. It's just terrible. Uh, Michael Benedetto, it's a pleasure to have you. As I said, we could have a dialogue on that for another half hour. Sure but can. We appreciate having you with us, and we'll, I promise we'll invite you back sooner than later. And I <laughs> promise I'll accept and be here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Folks, if you have further questions or comments on anything you heard on tonight's show or anything going on in the borough of the Bronx, email them to us at bronxtalk at bronxnet.org. You can send us a tweet at a Bronx Talk or post them on our Facebook page. Now, next week, we will get to the bottom of some very disturbing new data on date rape. And so that should be very interesting. The week after, we're going to talk about all the stuff that's been going on at the Jerome Park Reservoir. So you stick with us. We'll, we'll keep you informed. And we thank our producer is Helen Greenberg. Our new director is Richard Diaz. Thanks, Rich, for doing the job. And we'll see you, them and you. And, well, not him, but we'll see you all next week.